thank you sir for the you know introduction and um, thank you for giving me this opportunity and uh, i was always an you know avid reader of uh, devopedia articles and the work what they do there and uh, the well structured uh, blogs or articles what they write is very you know easy to grasp and for any learner right so it's very easy to understand in a systematic way so i always you know like the work what they are doing and uh, i'm i'm really happy to be uh, here in uh, to give a talk about the work what i'm doing and uh, i think uh, uh, we can get started with the work so currently a small introduction about uh, my current profile so i'm doing my masters here uh, in uni stuttgart and parallelly i'm working as a work student mm. so most of the projects what i work uh, are in computer vision domain and even my studies are also related towards uh, the computer vision and related specialization so i think um, in order to improve the experience like i'll uh, turn off my uh, camera and i'll be sharing the presentation uh, slides so i think that's fine by everyone so let's get started then yeah yes so so the today's talk uh, will be about a siamese neural network for uh, bread identification so may uh, i'm assuming that many people would have already you know uh, worked on some basic deep neural network architectures such as a uh, classification and those kind of um, you know problem statements but uh, when it comes to an industry point of view uh, there are many other problem statements that need to be solved um, but but they are not only limited to classification but they are also you know uh, towards you know detection the segmentation and also about you know uh, generating efficient uh, embedding vectors so in the future uh, slides i'll explain what's an uh, embedding or embedding vector is so this is just a brief uh, intro about the architecture side as well as uh, i'll be also introducing about the problem statement what i currently working um, so let's go to the next slide okay so uh, again a small uh, intro about me so i'm working as a artificial intelligence work student at a supermarket chain in uh, europe and united states so if you are in europe or any way in germany definitely you would have you know um, you know purchase some of the things in this particular supermarket chain but unfortunately i cannot really reveal uh, uh, the company the reason being uh, uh, europe uh, as you know uh, it takes this uh, you know data and the privacy as a topmost priority so the projects what i am working here uh, so uh, so i was um, uh, requested not to reveal the company where i am work not work currently working so but uh, definitely this uh, is nothing to do with the company but it's i'll, I'll try to keep it more towards as a generic uh, problem statement here so that everyone gets a you know clear cut uh, idea and uh, ga capture as much information as possible here okay so previously i worked as a data scientist at coffee beans consulting in bangalore so they i worked uh, more towards the nlp domain and also towards the recommendation engine so definitely uh, you would have read any of the recommendations that was served by uh, coffee beans uh, definitely it was like we were uh, and providing recommendations for top uh, clients uh, like top new news publishers in india so definitely you would have you know come across or read some news about it so and i also write some ai blog so and also i have my linkedin contact if you have any queries related to you know deep learning or data science or anything so you can uh, contact me anytime and so so let's go ahead then so yeah i'm planning to you know um, structure this particular talk in such a way i'm not going to give any uh, you know uh, much information about the code or the you know the coding practices all those things but i'll try to cover more towards a business perspective so when any person is given a problem statement how do you approach in a business perspective or if you are being as a consultant where in a consult uh, responsibility you have to handle the entire pipeline individually or as a couple of developers so i'll give you that information on how to handle a project and how to evaluate that project and uh, always there is a question in deep learning so what kind of architecture should i choose for a given problem statement so i'll give certain points on which you can design uh, decide on what type of architecture to choose for the given problem statement 
and parallelly i'll also uh, like share uh, what what's my personal project experiences with respect to this project or other projects so that it might help in making a better decision when you're working in this domain okay so first beginning uh, let me explain what's the problem statement is so this is a food production uh, uh, company uh, which uh, manufactures or which produces bread at large scale as you know europeans are well known for you know um, including or you know eating bread for most of the uh, their meals so that's the reason why we actually chose this particular project because uh, this is a large scale and bread definitely uh, this bread is produced like on a large scale on everyday basis the shelves of the supply chain uh, the shelves of the supermarket is been stacked with bread so this is one of the important reason why we chose this particular product other than this particular product there are other products what you see in a supermarket like jam or vegetables all those things but we currently targeted this particular problem statement like bread identification at different junction points so if you think of a conveyor belt right there are many different junction points so we wanted to identify this bread at different junction points so definitely they are sensors which counts the bread but we needed a solution to individually identify this type of bread so this information will be used as a quality purpose so let's say at one junction we have a certain set of breads and the next junction because of some quality check a small percentage of number of breads can be removed and then at the next junction we have a small subset of the bread and in the following uh, junction right because of many filtering process it might reduce so we'll have a specific solution so what type of breads are making to the final production or the um, the bakery what we call in the supermarket okay so this is one of the like extensive like uh, the background behind this problem statement and already we have a detection and a segmentation model but right now we wanted a solution for identifying the bread for comparing whether two breads are same so the ground level is whether we are compare so we are taking two bread images and we are going to compare whether they are same or different so this is the problem statement so yeah any questions uh, related to this problem statement so karthik uh, the conveyor belt may have more than bread other items also uh, and those are attempting to identify only bread is that right uh, no sir uh, lo, uh, let me go to the next slide maybe now it's more clear so we have a conveyor belt the conveyor belt has many number of breads but each bread has different patterns okay okay so now this is the, so this is the hypothesis what we had so uh, whereas a fingerprint right a fingerprint is unique to a individual person so mm -hmm. similarly the patterns on the bread right is also unique so there is so this is the hypothesis on which we built about build this solution so every bread has a unique uh, pattern on them so using this pattern we have to compare whether two breads are same at different junctions yes at different junctions yes okay okay, okay. thanks yeah so now i am dividing uh, this particular problem statement into two steps so the pre processing stage so the pre processing stage this solution which we already have this is a detection model so we take a image of the conveyor belt in a top angle then we are going to segment this bread and get individual bread images okay this is a existing solution we have a previous model the current problem task is i take this individual bread and compare it with different the other view so let's say at one angle uh, in the first junction uh, so the bread is tilted a little bit in the second junction there might be some disturbances and the angle might change of the bread so now at two different junction i'm taking two different images and i'm going to compare whether two breads are similar or not so this is why i'm this is how i'm going to identify so this bread number 1 and bread number uh, two whether they are same or not okay this is the problem statement so any questions regarding this okay so, so I, one second what are the augmentation techniques you used on yeah. the angle uh, so i'll be discussing that in the next stages so different different type okay. of augmentation that all those things um, okay so okay yeah ah, okay yes so i have structured uh, so every single um, topic in this talk 
and what are the lessons that i learned so initially when i when i was given this problem statement definitely i had lot of questions so why are we doing this project or what is the you know business aspect behind it so the first lesson what i learned was know everything about the data so i wanted to know about the manufacturing plant like how many data uh, these type of images are being generated and i also add questions regarding the angle because based on the angle the data is collected so let's say they are just collecting the data from one angle and you train a model and finally they give a different angle image so obviously it, the model will not perform um, uh, with a good accuracy for a different angle because the training data is uh, different and the test data or the in the production scenario the data is different so that's the reason first we have to define what is our data so one of the lesson know everything about the data and understand the problem statement talk to different people like manager level or even uh, to on the client side if you are building this solution for a client understand what is the problem statement and uh, so even a small question right it's always better to ask and understand get it clarified and talk to people and understand the process so this is very important because uh, there are two ways right they just give you the data and they ask you to solve this problem on the other hand they give you to the data and they also explain how did they generate the data and what are the situations or the scenarios or the environment that they consider and then they give you uh, the problem statement so it's always better to understand the process how did they generate and uh, uh, what were the steps involved in, gen in the data generation step okay so th these are the important lessons what i learned and then coming uh, to the next topic the data generation okay so initially when i received the data right it was just this in uh, this conveyor belt image so then what happened was so we used an existing uh, we had a detection model as well as a segmentation model but there was scenario uh, uh, it the process got delayed in order to get an approval to you know use the model because it was already in production so all those things so we wanted an alternative step so without the existing model how can i automate this uh, data generation process so what i did was first um, i we had the at stage a we, this is the input image at stage a now i am going to split this image into two steps uh, into two uh, sub images so for that i used arc transform to detect the horizontal line here and split the image so when i split the image right now uh, there is no disturbances there is no you know overlapping of this uh, uh, vertical bar on any of the breadths now so this becomes easy for the model in order to split it or in order to detect or else uh, in order to segment the bread so this was one uh, logic what i used arc transform and along with that i used some control logic let's say this uh, bar can never be at the top 10% of the image so when i used arc transform there is a possibility even this blue bar the conveyor belt right since even it has a horizontal line there is a possibility it might detect this line but uh, the one advantage is the color is different so the illumination of uh, the blue blue bars as well as the silver bar was different so hence i used some control logic in order to avoid those uh, false positives and only consider this uh, silver bar line to split the image into two sub images and then feed this individual split into a uh, segmentation model and this segmentation what we used was a mask rcnn to just to extract the data the reason being uh, since mask rcnn uh, the, it's a pre trained model it might be trained on different data set um, let's say like cfar 10 set data set but it may not match our use case like a bread image but since it was even segmenting it was detecting this as a feather it was detecting it as a feather so but still it was able to segment the bread properly so once it segmented i you segmented this bread separately and used it as a separate single bread image so this was one of the learning um, how to automate the data annotation process so this uh, was one of the advantage we instead of manually annotating or using any other pre trained model so we we you know uh, were able to uh, easily generate this data by with automation process so now whenever a new data comes we just feed this uh, through this automation pipeline and extract the data so it was uh, very simple so there was we reduced the manual annotation by uh, like 
60 to 70 percent. The last 30 percent we had to just for verification we used whether the segmentation is proper or not. So this was one of the you know um, uh, advantage of uh, using any pre-trained uh, models. So the second lesson was try to automate most of the boring tasks. So this was one of the advantage. And uh, coming back to the augmentation question. So in our use case, we add a question. So there are infinite number of augmentation that we can use, but which are the augmentations that are useful for our business use case? So I cannot use an augmentation like, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, the brick, the br definitely the brick, brick structure wouldn't change. I cannot use an augmentation like uh, change any augmentation which changes the bread structure makes it a vertical or a horizontal um, like it, it's not going to you know the frames should be fixed you are not supposed to you know randomly place the frames away so those kind of uh, augmentations was not included so the most of the augmentation what i used was rotation the vertical flip or the horizontal flip and the other scenario might be uh, there might be different lighting condition so i have to use the lighting condition uh, change uh, the saturation and even shuffle the RGB channel. So these kind of augmentation that I used and it also about random crop. So when there is a bread image, right, there is a possibility uh, where uh, you might miss out some portion. Like when we see the stage D, we don't have the entire bread image. Let's say this is like 80% uh, of the bread visibility re uh, region, right? So a random crop augmentation will also helpful. And it's also important what type of augmentation we use and we have to uh, uh, note it down or we have to capture what type of augmentation we have already used. Let's say um, we should be able to differentiate the type of data used during a training scenario as well as uh, in the production scenario. So let's say when the model is not performing, we should be able to answer, okay, the training data was uh, handled in such a scenario. Let's say I used a random RGB channel shuffle and I used a random crop of uh, between, uh, let's say 10% to 50%. So this was a scenario what I used for training my model. But let's say in a production scenario, something else happens. So we should be able to justify, okay, the scenario is different. So that's the reason why my model failed in the production scenario. So this was, this was one of the important uh, aspect note down what all augmentation and what level of augmentation you are using. So it's always better to use like a config file to have all this information stored. So this will be helpful in the production scenario in order to answer the questions. Why is your model failing? So then there is always a feedback loop, whether should I again retrain the model and and those things are the later stage. But um, the takeaway here is always uh, save it in a config file, what all augmentation and what degree of augmentation you are using. Okay. So this was the second uh, lesson, automate most of the boring tasks. So we are uh, this right now, the research is going at a higher pace, like in terms of segmentation model, there are always a state of the art models coming out. So there are two ways we can use this uh, ongoing research to augment, to annotate our data set, or to evaluate our data set. So that's how it's happening in the research. So whenever you see a research paper, right, there is always a performance increment. So whenever a paper claims that they have better performance than the previous version of the model, they also compare it with the previous, all the model architectures. So similarly, what we have to do is if we are claiming our model is better, we should have a baseline. So the existing uh, research based models, right, you can use it as a baseline state or else you can use it for automating the annotation process. So that's one takeaway here. So any questions uh, regarding the data generation or augmentation, anything related to data? So what is the label you provide uh, when you say annotate and label? You give the ID for each bread, is it? Yes, each, each bread has a unique ID. Yes, it's the ID. Okay. Okay, if there are 10 breads, you'll give one to 10 and which you use to match it. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Now that you automated it. Uh, yeah, the uh, that, that's also in the uh, in the automation pipeline because uh, so it let's say it's it's a bread. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't we are not going to classify the bread as one two whether this bread is number one or whether this bread is number two. 
i want to learn the features of that bread so mm-hmm. it, it, the id can be anything you can give a b c d because i'm only using this id just for evaluation purpose i'm not got using it. this label in my training uh, pipeline yeah got it yeah it can so, be uh, one red one answer yeah yes yeah uh, so uh, i we randomly use like id can be anything so yeah thanks yeah no problem and let's go to the next stage yeah the moral architecture so this was one of the uh, you know complicated uh, stage because when they gave the data uh, this was very much important because let's say uh, our where is the production environment so this is a conveyor belt so conveyor belt it will there is two ways either you deploy the solution in a cloud environment or you deploy it in an edge device so for our use case right now uh, we have the nvidia jetson nano board as a edge device so instead of because there is a possibility in the manufacturing plant right the there is a fluctuation of uh, internet connectivity or it like it, it's also about the bandwidth since it's a resolution high resolution images which we are transferring so there is always a delay so it should be always the solution should always be in sync with the conveyor belt line so it cannot uh, ret- you know give out the prediction with a higher lag so that's not a feasible solution so first decision what we made was we need a model and it should be in a edge device first thing it was it should be in edge device and in order to uh, fix a model in a edge device right there are many factors how many parameter should the model have how complex should the model be what is the latency of the model so these are many things which we have to consider and it's not only about the model it's also about the final logic so whenever you consider a deep learning project right there is a model which gives out the prediction and you use this prediction for your business logic so it's also about um, how much compute do you take for uh, you know executing your business logic so let's say a model considers like 60 or 70% of the compute the rest 30% should be for the business logic so it, it's always a in a trade off so so let's say um, if you are uh, you know using a different hardware architect uh, hardware right so like right now we are using a jetson nano there are different level of uh, the nano board uh, how much uh, complexity it can handle so it's always a trade off like if you go for higher uh, um, device it's also about the cost the business cost because you have to consider it's a um, conveyor line think about how many manufacturing plant they might have at at how many junctions you have to place this uh, camera along with the control uh, edge device so it's it, many factors should be considered so that's the reason we wanted a smaller model architecture so it could fit in a simple uh, the basic uh, nano board and it would have a you know quick uh, prediction response okay so these are the important considerations what we had and and many other questions we had to answer so, so what, what convolution neural network should i consider for feature extraction and what kind of model architecture and what should be my embedding vector because this embedding vector is the one which says what all features is been extracted from the image so let's say this embedding vector is the one which uh, extracts this feature image feature data from the bread and it's been represented in a latent vector let's say an image is 224 cross 224 cross 3 the image as a information but when you feed this image and the model learns the information about this image and finally it's down scaling it to a small vector size that is that is it uh, usually the research says if you have a vector size of 256 is is the best optimum one for any problem statement if you go higher like uh, 512 or even 1000 so it might become a complex uh, uh, lag on the device so if you go to a lower vector size right like 128 so it's it cannot be able to capture as much information as possible so as the current says current research says 256 is most of the optimum so when you start you start with 256 and uh, i'll share one of the experience i even tried with 128 i add a really you know a lower accuracy on the model so then i switched back to 256 because i was considering the hardware aspect so the lower uh, ad, the embedding vector i choose the better is the hardware but how is the performance so i am i am you know losing the performance there so with 12, 128 i tried 
the performance was bad but 256 the latency was okay um it was you know not as good as the 128 but the performance was also good with the 256 vector size so this was a important question to consider uh, what should be my embedding vector size and what all image augmentation should i use uh, so as i always as i already mentioned uh, the uh, so what type of augmentation should i use for my data so then what is my uh, production environment? As I explained, uh, the conveyor belt, the ma manufacturing plant, right? So how many number of uh, uh, edge devices would we have? So it was also taken into consideration while selecting the model architecture. And what loss function should I use? Yeah, this is also important because if we consider deep learning model, right? The feature extraction process is, uh, is I would say, is 50%. The rest 50% is the loss because you're updating the weights. The weights is... Uh, so the what degree of update you need is from the loss value. So the better the loss function is, the better it is able to capture the difference between different uh, images. So let's say we two images, if the loss function is very good, it cap it provides an higher output loss value. So then the the during the back propagation, right, you can update your weights efficiently. So the loss function is other 50%. The first 50% is the architecture, the CNN uh, network. What features you're extracting and loss function, how much is the difference? So, so these are the important things which we considered. So then since uh, again, uh, there was another uh, consideration. Why can't I train this like a classification model and then take the, uh, not the decision layer, that is not the softmax layer, the, the fully connected layer before, and use it as a vector. But that is again a problem. The reason being, it, it's an incremental uh, cycle, right? So maybe today there might be 10 breads and tomorrow it might be 20 breads. So I cannot individually label each uh, bread. Like it's an infinite uh, time. So that's not a scalable solution. And that that's one of the reason that particular architecture wasn't considered. And another reason is, here, I don't want to classify what the bread is. I want to compare. I want my model to learn how similar are two breads. So when I want my model to learn how similar two breads are, I should feed two images in order to say they are same or they are different. That's the reason we feed three images. The CNN network is the same because they are sharing the same weights, but I'm feeding three version of my uh, input image. That is the anchor image. The anchor image is always same as the positive bread. So it says anchor and positive should be closer. That is, they are they are similar bread. Whereas anchor and a negative right image, they are not this, they are dissimilar. So let's say here the pattern, the anchor image and positive image is the same because it has the same pattern because they are the same bread, but it is an augmented view. So positive is an augmented view of the anchor image, whereas a negative is a different bread. So now what is the model learning? It is trying to um, learn the anchor and the positive image are same, whereas the anchor and the negative image are different. How is that possible? Because um, the image goes in through the network, the embedding is generated and the triplet loss, right? The loss is the one which does, it pushes the anchor and the positive image closer and it pushes away anchor and the negative image away. So this is the objective of the model. So yes, uh, what is the lesson learned here? So there is always a solution like I can go for the state of the art models. So let's say in the CNN uh, stage here, right? I can go for a state of the art model or should I choose what my project requires? So I would always choose what my project requires over the state of the art model because uh, that is of more priority than choosing a state of the art model. Uh, because now if we see the, for one uh, example, if let's say state of the art model, it's uh, they are more towards the research side. When you see a research based model, right? Definitely they would have trained it for, you know, uh, many number of days. So we don't have that flexibility in an applied uh, deep learning side. So I want my model to be trained within. So usually they train the model overnight in a batch way. So I want it to be trained without within like one hour or two hours. So those are some different uh, scenarios when compared to a research side as uh, as well as on the um, uh, applied deep learning side. So I would always consider the project requirement over state of the art models. So this was one of the learning. 
and uh, any questions related to the model architecture or how does this you know work so the embeddings which have arrived at uh, from this network yes is that the label uh no uh, we are not using label at all here so the uh, so embedding is nothing but it's the representation so we have an image embedding is the identifier for each bread uh sorry sorry sir embedding is the fingerprint for each bread yes exactly embedding is the fingerprint in a smaller vector space but Got it. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so what exactly it is? Uh, sorry, embedding. See, you said it is not a fully connected uh, layer, also, right? So, what exactly uh, is it here? Okay. So, um, uh, so I said embedding is. Uh, so, there are two type of architectures. One for classification, and currently what we are using is Siamese. In classification, what happens is before the softmax layer, we have the fully connected layer, right? Right. But in classification based model, the learning is different. it is trying to take one image let's say a bread and it's trying to connect it with a label but right. it is not learning efficiently uh, representing uh, it won't efficiently represent the bread okay okay so uh, let me show some more slides maybe um maybe i'll just yes uh, okay so let's say uh, embedding is nothing but the extracted information from the cnn network and it has the information about the bread surface patterns okay yeah so and when i mention classification the learning objective in a classification model is different whereas the learning objective in this uh, siamese network is different right 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 So, yeah. so my question is so the, when you say embeddings here, yes. is it the uh, fully connected network? Whatever you get the vectors there, embedding vector, is it the same as that or something else? Yes, it is the same uh, fully connected layer uh, uh, vectors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, the triplet and loss is, here is uh, is a custom loss function. Uh, no, it's not That's a custom loss function. It's a so it's a triplet loss. so it's it's an existing it's the same as um, or is the cosine distance or the euclidean distance it's exactly yeah. the same but it's a it, it's a little bit different so it's trying to so what so i'll be explaining about the loss functions in the next coming slide uh, maybe then you will get a better idea of what is the like loss function doing but it's not a custom loss function so it's okay. an existing okay 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 a question on this cnn itself you said you have used rcnn right in this case uh no we have used uh, so so the rcnn what it's only for the data generation process okay it's only for the data generation pre trained uh, data generation the uh, the um the network what we there is what we have used here is a resnet network resnet 50 model resnet okay yes yes okay. got it oh okay. So okay, I'll again uh, carry it with the next slides. And, and sir, one more question. Maybe yeah. I joined a little late. So basically, no problem, here no you need to have the pairs, right? Anchor yes. and the positive ones, and anchor and negative ones. So when you generated the data, you have okay, not pairs. Maybe you have to say triplets here. So your data generation, you have to have multiple triplet samples here, right? That's how. Yes. Yes. You generate the data. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is like an uh, like. it's this is also like an extra information um so that that generation process is there right so having an anchor and a positive so this comes more on the coding side it's very simple so every bread has a unique id so with the same id but with an augmented view would become a positive with one id the different id uh, you can add augmentation or without augmentation is a negative pair so this so when you is say augmented you 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 rotated or you have you know Well, maybe magnified when you say augmented what is done here okay so in this uh, example the augmentation is a rotated augmentation let's say this, uh, the anchor yeah. as, uh, if you consider the say it has a, it is both are the same bread it say it. see understood uh, yeah. this is one pattern the same pattern okay, okay. Yeah. fine augmentation yeah. yeah no problem and uh, so on the research side what it says is the how efficiently you choose this uh, this uh, triplets right 
so uh, the efficiently you choose this the best the model becomes so let's say um, the complicated the augmentation is right it acts uh, also like a regularization so there is no overfitting of the model here so with the augmentation you can avoid overfitting or uh, the model overfitting scenario so that's also a scalable uh, you know solution okay and and but here uh, there is no uh, i mean no scope for taking the same bread with different angles that is not there is it in this example uh maybe so, say for from the different cameras from different angles you take the snap of the same bread then also it is the same bread we are talking about so that is yes, not possible exactly. here yes exactly so now how will i see this scenario is let's say in uh, one junction we have one type of camera in the next mm. junction we couldn't get the same camera but we have a different uh, camera with a different features uh, with a different uh, resolution or some lag because that's okay. the to avoid computation what they are saying is i cannot use the same resolution image i'll downscale and then send it to the model mm -hmm. so okay. in that case i should consider this scenario in my training procedure i will give anchor as in one resolution uh from one camera and the positive from the other camera image okay okay so i'm considering everything in the data side so the more okay. uh, control i have with the data loader or the data input it's it, it will be reflected in the production scenario okay so it's not just the rotation you are actually playing around with playing around with the resolution and other things also yes exactly so okay. so how i'm saying augmentation is nothing but Uh, we cannot go and capture the entire scenario from the uh, camera right so augmentation we are uh, replicating all the scenarios that we might expect in the production case okay okay uh, lightings yeah lightings bread might tilt to any different mm -hmm. direction so but the model should still learn let's say i give a straight bread i give a rotated bread it should still mm -hmm. say both the breads are same okay right so that's the advantage of this particular architecture okay um then let me go to the next thing okay the training objective okay, just a time check 20 minutes to go okay yeah sir yeah sure thank you so next to the uh, training objective so as i said the based on the anchor image right so the distance uh, between anchor and the negative before this is this scenario is before training anchor and the negative uh, it is shorter whereas anchor and the positive it is longer after training what happens is the anchor image and the negative image should have a higher distance whereas the anchor and the positive image should have a shorter distance so this is the training objective what my model should learn and the model should learn the embeddings in such a way this uh, requirement should uh, suffice okay so now the training and the loss function procedure so as i said the cnn network here right the cnn network what we have is a resnet model and this resnet model gives out three embeddings anchor embedding positive embedding and the negative embedding now i feed this embedding to the distance layer distance layer is nothing but it's calculating the distance uh, between anchor and the positive and anchor and the negative so that is the positive distance and the negative distance and now my loss is just uh, you know maximizing the distance so let's say the difference between this positive distance and the negative distance it is just maximizing it that's the loss function and this loss is taken and it's back propagated and all the weights are updated and again the next uh, iteration starts so this is what the objective uh, function does so let's say this is the function nothing but the embedding of the anchor image and the difference between anchor and the positive this is same as the difference between anchor and the negative and i'm just maximizing this i want to maximize the distance uh, between the anchor and the positive uh, sorry the anchor and the negative and reduce the distance between anchor and the positive so that's the training objective what i'm using here so if we see the distance layer's objective is to keep the distance between the anchor and the positive smaller than the distance between the anchor and the negative yeah so yeah any questions with respect to this slide these are three resnet models right not the one resnet model giving three embeddings uh it's a one resnet model giving three embeddings uh so let's say uh since they have the shared weights right so it's one single model i'm just feeding three input to the same model so it will give three embeddings okay okay yeah. so resnet is readily available is it for this architecture yes so this 
it, it is same as the existing ResNet. So we have to do some changes. We have to reduce only the, we have to remove the last uh, softmax layer and we have to use only the fully connected layer, the CNN, only the feature extraction part we have to use. Okay, shared weights also is part of, part of ResNet. Uh, yeah, shade weights, but we didn't use the shade weights because uh, the old, uh, the shade weights is nothing but, uh, so let's say, the CN is same. The CNN, okay. the ResNet is same with all these things. It's a one single model, but we have three inputs. That's when yeah. the triplet, we give three, three triplet input and the CN is, is the same. And we have three different embedding output. Got it. And then what is the role of the shared weights here? Yes, shared weights is, uh, so when we update in the back propagation, right? It's not updating three, three uh, CNNs. It's updating just one because it's the same weights that's been shared across three CNN. There is no three CNN here. It's only one CNN. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, Thanks. just for explainability purpose, uh, this uh, image is shown. It's only one CNN. Uh, okay. That's the... Okay, got it. Now I got it. Thanks. Yeah. So, so basically when you're training, I think if I can add to that, when you're training, yeah. you're training for that loss function, right? To minimize that loss function. In this case, you are saying maximize. Maybe you will say inversely, Proportion it uh, and make it uh, minimize. Right? No. So let's say now hmm, there is this positive distance and the negative distance. Hmm. I am taking the maximized of this distance. So let's say uh, this is a difference, right? Uh, the distance between the this is the positive distance value and this is the negative yeah. distance. Right. Now when I take this difference, I get this value. Uh, we have the positive, the negative value and the, the positive uh, distance. And I, when I take the difference, right, I get this, this value, the margin value. Right. I want to maximize this margin value. That's what the maximization is doing. Okay. Yeah. So, and here the margin value, right? It's my control. How much, how much uh, for, so what level of difference should I need? If I give the mag margin as 10, so the dis difference between, it's more like a bias. Margin is, uh, consider margin as a bias value. So what is the minimum distance I need between this positive and negative is the margin. So this is what I want to maximize. That's what I'm learning. Okay. And what is that alpha there? See, you, the first two is a difference of positive and... Uh, yeah, uh, this alpha is the margin value. Distance. The margin value. By what margin should the difference be? Okay, that alpha is a mar margin. Yes. So here, wh whatever you are showing in this formula, the first one is a is nothing but a positive distance, I think, right? Positive distance, next yes. one is a negative distance. The difference of those two, and you are saying plus alpha. Alpha is a margin here. Yes, yes. So, but I'm trying to just interpret this formula. Okay. Yes. The initial two terms are nothing but the difference between positive and negative distances, right? Uh, it's the difference between anchor, the anchor embedding A, your XI of A and xi of p the different the distance between anchor and the positive okay and here the anchor and the negative negative mm -hmm. and i need uh, this margin level of difference so that's uh, that's the minimum margin okay so for, uh, in order to like explain so let's say the distance between anchor and the positive is some 10 units and the difference between anchor and the negative is uh, 5 units so in this scenario, what is the scenario? The positive is farther away than the negative. Mm -hmm. right? So in that case, 10 minus 5, we have 5 plus I need a margin now. So my, if I don't use the margin, I'm only considering uh, the loss as 5. Right? If I'm using a margin, let's say margin as 5 more units, the loss becomes twice. Right. So I so now since the loss is large, right? So it means so the model is penalizing still more. So since the large loss is large, so ideally what happens is this difference should be zero, and it only should be with the margin. So that's the model is uh, learning objective is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so hi, Kat. it's Ajit here. Uh, so can you tell me the reason why you went with the ResNet model? Okay, yeah. So we had to exp like first we experimented with just an MLP, like stacking up uh, corn layers 
and then finally with a dense layer but the model was really underfitting with these architecture okay so then uh, when we ne the next uh, option was we went with the resnet model the reason being resnet has this skip connection whereas um, it avoids uh, so the advantages of this skip connection architecture is it avoids uh, the you know vanishing gradient problem so that's the reason first we tried with mlp since it was underfitting then we chose uh, the resnet model because it had some advantages because it is well designed with respect to the skip connection so then uh, we got good accuracy with resnet so then we stick with the architecture and it's also when we compared it with the baseline on a uh, nano device so it was the latency was uh, equal to our use case required so then we fix with the resnet architecture okay okay fine then yeah. so i'll move on to the next slide so yeah so one of the lesson what i learned was the model architecture since uh, it's only about not about resnet and we used on top the distance layer so for any uh, solution right you should be able to control the architecture it's uh, there are one ways you can just use the architecture directly but there might be scenario where uh, you have to reduce some layers in order to improve the accuracy or you have to add some extra uh, layers so in order to improve the accuracy maybe for example instead of using the fully connected net uh, layer right so if you use a uh, global average pooling so that that also is an advantage it reduces the complexity of the model so that was one of the learnings what we also saw in so that was one of the lesson like own your architecture so yeah the final uh, is about the evaluation metrics so um, okay we have the loss function but what is the evaluation metrics for so in a business use case they might ask for kpis that is key performance indicator let's say the evaluation metric let's let me give one query image like i give this query image and i need top 5 similar bred results so if my query image matches the top first result that is top one score if my query image is available in one any one of the top 5 score that is my top uh, in any one of the top 5 results that is the top 5 score so the objective uh, what we used um, the reason why we use this because it actually matched with our business use case that is when i give a query image it should be able to uh, return the similar bred in the top one result when i mean top one result which is the minimum distance between the query image and the result image let's say the distance between this query image and uh, the top one result right will be shorter when compared to the distance between the the query image and the fifth result so that's where that is the evaluation metrics what we used and what are the lessons uh, here what i learned was always the evaluation metrics right it should always consider the business kpis when you uh, explain it to a manager so he needs what is the outcome of this project and what is the evaluation uh, score what we have now so this will be able uh, so in this case you will be able to connect it with the business use case okay then you know it will be easy to evaluate okay this project is uh, you know is in sync with the business use case so that's one of the lessons what we can, learned can you please repeat that no? uh, this last function in the evaluation matrix okay top one and top five okay so let's here, say here, are we saying top one means it's a most similar compared to the other four yes yes it's okay. most similar compared to the other four yes Okay. No, no, but where, where is the evaluation metrics? How are we saying? I'm not getting okay. that. Okay. 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 Cool. So uh, I can explain that. So evaluation metrics. Uh, this is top one score. So let's say the query we give. Uh, so this is also on the coding side. So we uh, write a custom function. Okay. Mm -hmm. We write a custom function where the model returns the embedding for this query image. Okay. similarly it returns embeddings for all the other uh, bred images okay right now i calculate the distance that is a cosine distance or a euclidean distance uh, between the query embedding vector and that other all the existing uh, bred uh, vectors one by one it's a one one is to one matching okay now i take the 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 closest bred image which has the least distance so when i say right. least distance right it is more similar to the query bred image right right but my question is where is this 5 coming from do you already know you wouldn't know right 
but query okay. image is coming okay yeah got it so uh, in uh, in research what happens is either you should match so this is an arbitrary five number maybe you can even take top 10 score but in our business use case right we wanted mm. this query image should be within the in the worst scenario it should be within the top 5 uh, bred images and top one is the one is to one matching so in our use case we took the top five so it it's an arbitrary number what we have chosen mm -hmm. okay so if you have the flexibility right some business might be okay if i get the similar bred image in the top 10 images cool so then okay. it can be an arbitrary number you can take top 10 score okay Okay. So, so, so you are if, saying, for example, if there are hundred images, yes, at least your model should be able to match with the top five. Yes, top, exactly. Right, exactly. That's what yes. we are we are saying here. Yes, okay. yes. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, as an example, uh, like in a recommendation engine, right? Let's say if you uh, take one uh, image, so let's say it might be a shirt image, uh, for instance, in Mintra, it might be a shirt image, and you get in a recommendation top five uh, uh, shirt images. whereas if this shirt is a uh, one shirt matches with only the first one that is the top one score okay it is matching if your this shirt is in the top 5 of the recommendation list yeah then it is a top 5 score so that was one of the business use case what we used but it might be different for different use case even let's say in mintra it has to show 10 images 10 recommendations then it it makes sense to consider top 10 score so that was uh, so that's the evaluation matrix like uh, yeah, why we choose like, top 1 and top 5 okay it's a nice example okay no problem yeah Thanks. oh yeah i discussed about this lesson yeah and yeah i'm uh, at uh, like at the final end of my talk and uh, just a shout out to mr uh, arvin sir and even uh, my mentors navin beni and uh, santosh and now i think we can open up for uh, q and a so you can ask like any doubts with respect to this uh, project or even anything in generic with respect to deep learning or anything so i'll try to uh, turn on the video so yeah maybe this question is because i was not in the beginning yeah no problem yes yeah. hold on where is this bread uh, what is the business yeah. use case here okay i think uh, hold on Let's give chance to others also to ask questions. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> so I have a couple of uh, practical questions, uh, Karthik. Yes, sir. So uh, you mentioned about performance on the hardware, and you are using uh, Jetson. Yes. So how? What is the response time? Uh, how quickly can you detect which are the top five and top one? okay so currently uh, we have a baseline so right now uh, we want uh, this uh, top one top uh, so i don't differentiate between uh, so let's say uh, the problem statement is what is the uh, uh, response time i don't differentiate between the top 5 and top one so if we go to the fundamental question how quickly is it able to convert my image to a vector so this is my model how how, how quickly it's able to convert my image to a vector and rest everything is the pro, uh, business logic where i am going to ca compare the uh, distance so my response time uh, here with respect to the model should be in terms of like uh, currently we have kept it at uh, milliseconds range so that is a millisecond range uh, so still it's on the you know in the experimental stage still we haven't fixed but right now what we have is it should be in the millisecond range the process where you feed an image and it should return the vector so it should be okay. a millisecond range that's what we have considered now so after that the next step is obviously to find uh, the similar image like top 1 top 5 yes exactly now, exactly how many uh, in the practical scenario how many comparisons are you expected to compare let's say you get a embedded vector yes i do you need to compare against 1000 uh, other bred samples or 100 other bred samples yes so uh, currently in a conveyor uh, at one particular point of time right we are expecting somewhere uh, like uh, 40 to 50 bred image let's say 50 uh, breds in one, one at any one point of time you can have 50 breds in the conveyor belt okay so now when we consider this bred right uh, so this is the number with respect to the number of breds 
and with coming back to the jetson nano jetson nano has a gpu inbuilt so where you can batch process it so i can give let's say i can give all this 50 image at one shot and at one time and i can get the embeddings for all the 50 breads got so, it so yeah. so ideally a gpu right uh, so a gpu is designed to handle multiple inputs parallel process so that was one of the advantage why we went to jetson nano and it's also about the scalability so let's say now we have to increase our production so this shouldn't restrict our uh, uh, the business uh, you know we would, let's say we would have set up entire system but now they want to increase the production let's say at one point of time it should be like 100 breads at one junction so then there this shouldn't be a bottleneck so still the jetson nano should be able to, so that's for reason now it has a batch and uh, it should be able to like uh, give out the vector embeddings quickly that's the reason so the number of breads shouldn't be a bottleneck for the hardware device got it yeah yeah any questions from others please carry on somebody has raised ramana then go ahead yeah so can you go to the restnet restnet yeah. screen yeah sure so uh, if i understand correctly you are giving three images as a input to the restnet all three images at the same time uh, yes so now uh, so yeah that's a good question so now we have one restnet model only one model yes one model yeah so but we are giving three images at a time at a time basically you are appending the matrices you are uh, so uh, let's say um, uh, that's that's one way like we can append the matrices or else so i'm again coming back to the objective so the objective is the image should be converted to a vector okay yes so we can up, uh, so you cannot append the image so it should be a three different image three different image and it should be given uh, three times so that is three individually three images should be given individually to get the vector so which means uh, how are you sharing the weights you are saying you are sharing the weights among all three images if yes. you are giving it as a three inputs three different inputs you will get three different vectors yes and uh, how are you ensuring the uh, weights are shared okay. amongst okay. the three yeah got it so now uh, let's say uh, okay it is not three different resnet model it's just one resnet and mm -hmm. we have three inputs as you said we the output will will have three vector embeddings for three mm -hmm. images mm -hmm. now we are going to calculate the loss the entire final loss is just one number it's mm -hmm. the distance number let's say 10 units mm -hmm. this 10 units one number is used to update the weights of the one resnet model okay okay uh, so this now what's happening is now we are not up, uh, updating three resnet since we are using only one cnn right so here they have mentioned you are using one single loss to update the resnet weights so that's what they are saying even though for different images for different anchor positive negative the update is only once when when you give three distinct images and three different inputs we are you are going to do it sequentially one after the other uh no so this so as i previously mentioned this image is only to represent uh, the flow but okay. ideally it is only one resnet model three inputs you have three outputs okay okay can i add something here yeah please yeah see see basically they are using the one resnet here to get the embed three embeddings that's all they are using for each image from the same ResNet model, they are getting the embeddings. From the embedding, they are, they are computing the positive distance and negative distance, and then they are trying to maximize it. Am I right uh, here? Yes, okay. exactly, sir. And so there's only one model, that's all. Yeah, it's only one model, but this architecture, right, it just to explain or to show that uh, uh, this is the flow. So if I just give one, uh, so let's say if I just use one CNN here, it also creates confusion. So here, in terms of shade weights, is nothing but. Uh, so okay, I'll give a better example. So there are two scenarios. Either you use one model and you update with weights, 
or you use three different uh, resnet and do the same weights for all the three so the right the second option right it's more complex and it's more computationally tough okay. whereas on the right side we use one resnet model just update the one so in order to explain that they have used the shade weights concept here okay uh, last question uh, yeah, go to the resnet architecture uh, the yes. next slide uh, yes. you are uh, this is for training at the time of prediction you don't yes. have a negative embedding positive embedding you have only one image yes uh, yes uh, do you use the same network to predict or anything different yeah so in that case uh, we no longer need this distance layer right we don't need this distance layer positive yes. embedding and negative embedding as well yes we only we will only need the embeddings so we will just cut we'll just use this network the resnet network where it gets uh, gives out the embeddings and on the business logic side i will use a cosine distance the distance between the negative embedding and the positive embedding but you will be feeding only one image in this case at the time of prediction or three images yes. yes so now what happens is at a conveyor at one junction uh, let's say we have 50 images we feed 50 images we will get 50 vectors right oh yeah yeah now you going to do one is to n comparison of cosine distance okay yes uh, so that is what i am going to do one is to n comparison of cosine distance and after that i'll just take the minimum distance the least distance mm -hmm. between the one image and the n images so that least distance is the similar bread image okay okay thanks yeah for uh, there good any good. yeah sir one follow up question will yeah, there sure. be any cut off here because none of them may be similar also right um so for example signature yeah. matching okay yes. i have say uh, i have signed for somebody else okay hmm. now you are matching my signature yes right so, so it may it so in that case what will you do there has to be some minimum cut off right if the embed if the distance is more than this you may have to declare it as a wrong one ah uh, okay your what you are asking is is there any like a threshold uh, which say, which says okay um, beyond this threshold it means uh, it's similar or be, uh, like below this threshold it means it's dissimilar right. or there might be a scenario where none of the bread matches right that exactly. right yes so yeah that's a good question like like a threshold as of now right um, mm -hmm. when you set a threshold it's also about with respect to your training data now let's say if i'm going to set a threshold it might change in the future so right now we haven't set any threshold we are only focusing on um, so we have an hypothesis all our training data will have a positive image oh, and okay. even the test scenario it's an hypothesis uh, definitely we will have a some matching bread images because if we see in a conveyor belt what is the scenario uh, where a bread might miss misses it only because of the filtering or any quality check but 100% i'm sure from one junction if i uh, one bread is there the probability of it coming to the end right if there is no any filtering process in between definitely that bread will come there okay in a, in a yeah. conveyor it's, line yeah actually it's a reverse a bread in station number n must have gone through the previous n minus 1 stages a bread is oh. cannot be introduced suddenly into stage n uh sorry sorry sir uh, can you repeat you have that? these junction points right yes yes so let's say there are three junction points a b c yes bread cannot suddenly appear in stage 3 without going through a and b yes yes that's true yeah so the reverse situation is what uh, krishna prasad is asking so if a bread suddenly appears in stage 3 uh, then it will obviously not match any of the current uh, embeddings yes because uh, it so, has not been seen before in stage a and b yes exactly so uh, yeah please go ahead here yeah. uh, that's all i wanted to share nothing more okay yeah because in a conveyor line yeah that's uh, so whenever we think about a problem statement we consider this hypothesis okay definitely the at junction 2 the number of breads which comes right it is definitely present in stage uh, stage the previous junction so this is one of the hypothesis and we verified this with the production food production uh, line uh, the manufacturing people 
and they yeah so this was one scenario but there can be a business logic or problem statement which might be different in that case we have to think about a you know a different solution to handle this then when do you handle this maybe either you handle it in the model building stage or at the business logic stage or else at the beginning when these kind of scenarios right right comes right you have to differentiate saying okay this is an outlier which the model cannot predict so these kind of things will be handled like the pre processing stage or in the business logic stage so that's that's how it is so right now it's only the neural network which is matching so the neural network is give a image it should match that's it thank you so much uh, any further questions maybe it's one a, more question if somebody has it's a great project nicely explained thanks